Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today I have a video for you that I wanted to make, which is really just gonna be covering all the best practices and tips and tricks you need to know for running Apache Iceberg effectively as a data lake. Um, so to provide some context, you know, Iceberg has emerged as probably the top open table format for data lakes um, because it has a ton of features. You got scheme evolution, time travel, asset transactions, hidden partitioning, all built in. Um, and it was actually built by Netflix um, and then handed off to the Apache Foundation. Um, and it addresses a lot of the limitations of older data lake formats like Hive, um, but also gives you really solid foundations through a lot of that built-in tooling for then building scalable, reliable, and interoperable data lakes across many different query engines, across many different sources um, and destinations. So. In this video, we're going to cover architecture and deployment strategy, how to schema, design your schema and partitions, um, data ingestion, file management, query optimization, uh, maintenance and table management, and more. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. So first category we're going to talk about is architecture and deployment strategy and how you want to design the location of your storage and your compute. Um, and really, the guiding principle you're going to want to have here is to decouple storage and compute leverage the separation of storage and compute that Iceberg allows by you know, storing your Iceberg tables in dirt cheap cloud object stores like S3 buckets, like Azure Data Lake, like Google Cloud Storage, while using query engines like Spark, Trino, Flink, Python, Snowflake now has, has made a real big push for, for supporting Iceberg compute um, to actually run uh, and transform your data. Um, and then what's, you know, tabular is a stand-in for here, and you can use really any kind of catalog system, um, is having a catalog management that manages the interaction between your actual data and the compute layer. Um, so you have the old school Hive catalog, which is probably not what you want to use. Um, you also have AWS Glue or AWS Lake Formation, which are really good for managing cataloging with their integrations into AWS services. Um, you also have Nessie or Project Arctic, um, and those are just kind of Git-like version control branching and isolation for data changes. Uh, and then finally, you have the REST catalog, which offers language-neutral REST APIs and more flexible deployment op options. Um, so really, you want to build a modular architecture for, for designing your data lake. So now, I want to talk about schema and partitioning design. Um, and one thing you're going to want to think about when you're you know, working with Iceberg, if it's the first time working with you know, a data lake tool, is that Iceberg supports safe scheme evolution, um, but you're going to want to avoid dropping columns without a deprecation phase um, because you need to <clears throat> let Iceberg essentially know that that column is being removed. If you just delete it, uh, it's going to just go poof, and there's not going to be a record of the previous uh, pipeline and snapshots occasionally. Um, also, heavily use things like column comments and metadata properties to document schema intent. Um, so you have you know, not only just obviously the tracking changes to the schema itself, but also an understanding of why those changes happened. Um, and then use versioning, which is built into Iceberg, to track schema changes over time as well. Um, you also have the option to use hidden partitioning. Um, and with hidden partitioning, you can actually abstract this kind of partition logic where, you know, booking table or what type of partitioning is being used um, and use things like functions like days, timestamp column or bucket, you know, every one user ID uh, for 100 of them um, for optimized query pruning. So you can say, hey, instead of actually Opt, you know, having users entered all this optimization where they're selecting what dates they're going to use, um, you actually do that under the hood. <clears throat> um, and this will help expose, you know, number one, ex avoid, uh, will help you avoid exposing partition columns directly in queries. Um, and then also hidden partitioning prevents common mistakes like querying raw partitions. Um, and that then also helps improve query performance with less user error because you're not relying on the user to do it. You're building the partitions in under the hood um, and the database itself, Iceberg itself, part you know routes that query to the correct partition um, without the user necessarily needing to know what that partition is. Now, I want to talk about a couple tips I have for you on data ingestion and file management. Number one, use append-only patterns when possible. Um, if you're using append-only ingestion, it's going to much simplify the consistency and reduce the need for any kind of conflict resolution during concurrent writes um, because you can just have two writes append to each other. Um, and 
this is going to allow multi-threading, which is something that Iceberg is quite good at handling and has a big advantage in helping your data ingestion actually move faster. Um, you're also going to have you know, an optimal file size of around 100 to 500 megabytes for Parquet files to balance the read and write costs. Um, so try and you know, split up your data uh, and then use Iceberg compaction jobs to merge small files post ingestion um, to make sure that you're staying within that optimal file size so that your uh, data can be efficiently read and write to, written to. Um, and then you can use Flink, Spark, or just actually built-in Iceberg actions like rewrite data files to help automate this process as well. Um, you also have the option to enable write isolation. You definitely should. Um, Iceberg snapshot-based architecture, which you know are maintained within this Iceberg catalog, allows concurrent writers via optimistic concurrency. Um, then you can use things like lock managers or branching strategies, um, which are basically just different ways of handling who's uh, you know if two writers are writing at the same time, who's actually gets propagated first um, to avoid conflicts in those types of environments as well. Um, so you know you do have some trade-offs, but there are strategies to handle those trade-offs with Iceberg. Now, the next topic I want to discuss is query optimization. Um, the reason why I have this diagram up here that has metadata on it, um, and just kind of talking about the structure of Iceberg, is because metadata tables are really important for query optimization. Um, you, know, you have a lot of different metadata tables like files, snapshots, manifests, that you can go to analyze different snapshots, different configurations of your data to help you debug performance issues, understand table composition. Um, and that's really the first place you're going to want to go to optimize and debug your queries. Um, then you're also going to want to make sure you are optimizing partition pruning. Um, ensure your query engines support Iceberg's partition pruning and push down capabilities. So making sure you're using the latest versions of Trino, Spark, or Flink. Um, and then also something that's experimental, just kind of coming out now, um, is Z order clustering. Um, so techniques or clustering techniques like Z ordering help you to optimize your columnar access patterns for more high dimensional queries. Um, and so if you're interested in really going deep in the weeds and optimizing uh, your storage, Z order clustering could be something um, to try enabling. Not sure if it's worth the investment of time yet, but time will tell. Now, next thing I wanna talk about is maintenance and table management, the less sexy but still important uh, actions you'll need to take to just make sure your iceberg tables uh, keep running, running smoothly. Um, and the first thing I wanna think about is compaction and optimization. Um, and you know, compaction, as we talked about earlier, is the condensing of multiple small files into a couple of larger files to make sure you're staying in that 100 to 500 megabyte range. Um, and so scheduling periodic data file rewrites and manifest merges helps make sure that you're doing this on a consistent basis, making sure that your data is in the most optimized file format. Um, and you can also use things like uh, icebergs, again, built-in functions for rewrite data files, rewrite manifest, expire snapshots actions to help condense these files. Um, and also throw away some of those snapshots that are maybe old enough that they are no longer useful and there's no chance of you actually needing to go back to them. Um, and so with snapshot expiration, you can actually set um, saying, hey, you want to expire snapshots that are older than a certain time period. Um, and this is for obviously the purpose of saying, hey, once data is, you know, older than this, you know, year older than or, you know, five years old, whatever your data retention policy is, you say we're going to delete that. Um, and that's important for keeping, you know, the number of metadata files and amount of orphan data you actually have manageable. It, it's just not tenable to have snapshots going all the way back until the beginning of time within your iceberg environment. So implementing a date that you're comfortable with throwing everything out uh, from that day before is useful. Um, and finally, orphan file cleanup, um, you know, running uh, Iceberg has a built-in function called remove orphan files that will throw away any clean and clean up any unused data files after a failed write or manual deletion. Um, so this is, you know, if you have a query that only partially runs successfully, um, then you can use the orphan file cleanup to go through and delete all of those tables throughout your environment, which again is really useful for just cleaning up and make sure you're not paying for storage of stuff you're not going to use. Next thing I want to talk about is Apache Iceberg time travel, travel and auditing. Um, one of Apache Iceberg's key features is snapshot-based time travel, where you can roll back to previous versions of your data, um, and you can also run back-in-time queries. So if you want to run a query on that previous version of the data, you can do that as well for things like auditing, um, but also really useful for rollbacks in case of an erroneous data load or any kind of corruption of data. You can roll back to a previous stable version of your data. 
Um, and here you're going to want to make sure you're, you know, setting clear retention policies of, you know, hey, I want to take a snapshot at the end of every day, at the end of every week, at the end of every month, um, and I want to retain the last 30 snapshots. Um, you know, really, your needs for snapshots are going to be dictated by your business. Some I not need um, a lot of historical snapshots, but needs a lot of really recent snapshots because they make a lot of rapid changes, which make break things, and vice versa. Um, so make sure you're using it, but the way you're actually using snapshots is going to definitely depend pretty heavily on what you're actually using the Apache Iceberg for. So now the last thing I want to talk about is monitoring observability and data lineage. Um, number one, make sure you're setting up integrations between Iceberg and your existing monitoring and observability dashboards so you can keep track of you know, number, size of snapshots, performance, number of files, file counts, sizes, query latency, uh, active versus passive files. Um, and this is where you're going to bring in tools like Prometheus, Grafana, CloudWatch, um, but really whatever you have already off the rack to observe the system health of Iceberg. It doesn't really require any super specialized systems. Um, and then also start thinking about integrating Iceberg with tools like Open Lineage. Um, that's really where we're starting to see, you know, a lot of organizations start to use Open Lineage as kind of the Apache for Lineage um, to track metadata changes in column level lineage um, to understand how their data is evolving over time. Um, and so the earlier you get it set up and working with Iceberg, the less hard it's going to be to eventually integrate it down the road when someone tells you to. Um, but those are all the tips and tricks I had to share with you on Apache Iceberg today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Data guy out.